Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dee Dee Steepen. As positive cases of COVID-19 continue to spike across much of the country, the role of contact tracing to prevent further spread becomes even more important. When it comes to contact tracing, quarantining, and isolation, timing is critical to prevent further exposures and spread of the disease. Joining us to discuss is Mayo Clinic Preventative Medicine Specialist, Dr. Laura Breer. Dr. Breer is Medical Director of Occupational Health Services at Mayo Clinic. Welcome to the program. Dr. Breer, could you describe contact tracing and what role it plays in preventing further spread of the virus? Yes, I'd be happy to. So contact tracing is essentially the process of identifying those who may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19, doing a risk assessment of that exposure and facilitating quarantine if we do identify that they're at risk of developing COVID. And that quarantine makes sure that that person stays home, does not in turn expose others should they develop COVID during that 14 days. So early on in this pandemic, your team in occupational health developed digital tools to conduct contact tracing. Can you explain for our audience how this works? Our staff really needed the information much more quickly, and we needed to be able to assess them as quickly as possible so that we could help them quarantine. So we developed digital tools, including a digital contact list. So we integrated our occupational health database to pull in information from our HR database for our employees so that we could send a contact log to a supervisor and they could go through and actually pick the names of their employees, send it back to us, and we would have their phone numbers at our fingertips to be able to start reaching out and calling them immediately. We also developed a second tool, which was an exposed employee assessment form. So when the supervisor submits that contact log, every one of those employees who is potentially exposed gets an email in their workplace inbox to ask them certain questions about potential exposure. And by doing that, we're able to notify anywhere from one to 50 people all in a few seconds that they may have been exposed. And then we go through and we do the, we do the digital assessment and we've created some processes to facilitate the work of multiple different teams with that. We outlined our processes in a um, paper on Mayo Clinic proceedings so that it could be shared with others if they're interested in looking at that. How has contact tracing evolved over these past few months? And, and does this, this current surge in COVID cases that we're seeing impact how contact tracing works in the healthcare setting? So contact tracing has definitely evolved early on in the pandemic when no one was wearing masks and often a COVID-19 diagnosis came as a surprise after someone had had a lot of contact with many different people. We would identify someone who was COVID positive and we would look back at who they may have had close contact with less than six feet for an extended period of time. And we found that each COVID positive person exposed potentially a lot of other people. And that's because in our day-to-day lives, normally pre-pandemic, we did a lot of things, you know, we, we were in a lot of areas close together with close contact with others. With the evolution of the pandemic, I think that one thing is, that has changed is that in recent months with the surge, we're having an increased number of COVID positive individuals. So we have more people we need to reach out to. But fortunately, each of those people has exposed few others or sometimes They've exposed no other people because they've been practicing social distancing, diligent masking, and hand washing, and so they can confidently say they haven't exposed anyone else. And that's a win every time we hear that, that there was no one else exposed. I guess in general, where where would you say most COVID exposures are occurring at this point in the pandemic? So social gatherings, far as restaurants, workplace, school. Most of the exposures, uh, from my experience, are are occurring in the community. Healthcare centers and schools have very good precautions in place to prevent exposure. I've been very impressed with the measures that schools have taken to prevent exposure from hybrid learning so that class sizes are smaller, social distancing, wearing masking, wearing masks and those things. But certainly out in the community, especially if you're going to a place where you can't have confidence that other people will be masked, 
masked and will abide by those precautions, those are very risky scenarios. So if someone were to test positive for COVID-19, but declined to share their close contacts with health officials so they could, of course, conduct the contact tracing, what are the unintended consequences of doing so? If an individual who tests positive is unwilling or unable to disclose who they had contact with, public health or their designees, such as healthcare or occupational health practices, can't in turn warn and assess those people that may have been exposed. So we can't notify people who may have been exposed and advise them to quarantine, which means that they could develop COVID during that 14 days after that exposure, and they could in turn expose others. Most people feel perfectly well early on in their illness. We know that people are contagious up to 48 hours prior to onset of symptoms or prior to a positive test. And so it's very likely that those people will expose others. Well, two terms we've heard a lot this year, quarantining and isolating. What is the difference between quarantining and isolating? So isolating is the practice of someone who's sick, staying at home and not having contact with others. So we use isolation for people who are sick, people who have symptoms that might be COVID related or people who have tested positive for COVID. Quarantine is for people who have been exposed to someone who's tested positive for COVID, but they're actually feeling fine themselves. So most people who are under quarantine are asymptomatic and they are staying at home away from others so that if they develop COVID prior to the, them knowing that they have it, they wouldn't in turn expose other people and keep passing on the COVID. So both of these things are very important and stop the chain of transmission. Let's talk about if someone in the household is under quarantine. What supplies should families have on hand if that were to happen? Because would it be safe to leave the house and say go to the grocery store if there was someone in the household that was that was quarantined. So if there's someone in the household who's sick, um, who has COVID or is isolated, all other individuals in the household are quarantined and no one should go any, anywhere. So that's kind of the worst case scenario and it's good to plan for that scenario. In general, I think it's a good idea to have about a week's supply of groceries on hand. I know prior to the pandemic, I would go to the grocery store every couple of days and pick up a few things. Now we get groceries once a week to make sure that we have a few more days of supply. Grocery stores will deliver food also, so that really helps to have people comply with that quarantine and stay home. If you have someone in the household who has been exposed and that person's quarantined, but their family members haven't been exposed, in general, keeping the quarantine person away from everyone else is a good idea so that the other people can go about their day-to-day -day lives. You know, we're seeing the numbers, they're increasing exponentially across the country. What advice do you have for people who may just want to throw caution to the wind and take their chances with getting the virus? So I would ask everyone to stay strong and fight that pandemic fatigue. I think that we have all felt it at one point or another within, you know, the last nine or 10 months. And as much as we can stay strong and not give in to that, I think that we'll all get through this together. That being said, if someone does do something like they have a gathering with family or they have a gathering with friends, I would urge them to kind of get back on the wagon and keep wearing their masks, keep practicing social distancing. Um, even after that event, don't give up altogether. Even if you had one situation where you did something that was kind of outside of your normal routine. Well said. Dr. Breer, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I think that the only other thing that I would want to add is as we approach the holidays, more of us will be invited to those social gatherings. Those are an important part of our traditions, especially in the U.S. with Thanksgiving and Christmas. And so encouraging people to be very creative with those. If there are ways that you can have virtual gatherings with family instead of um, the large face-to-face -face gatherings that we're used to, the better. And if you do have face-to-face -face gatherings, having conversations with your family beforehand to make sure that everyone practices all of the precautions, including masking diligently for 14 days before they gather to decrease that risk that someone will bring COVID to the gathering would be a good idea. Well, our thanks to Mayo Clinic Preventative Medicine Specialist, Dr. Laura Rear, for joining us today. 
Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.